good morning or good afternoon. It could also be the wee hours of the morning, depending on what time you're choosing to tune in with us here at the Nonprofit Show. But we are so excited to have Jennifer Banks joining us today. She is a manager with Your Part-Time Controller, and she is here to talk to us about Tis the Season Budget Planning. And so this is a really Critical conversation. Uh, I we love. I shouldn't say I because I know you too, Julia. Really love all of the individuals, representatives from your part time controller. We've learned so very much from each and every one of you, Jen. So can't you know wait to to learn more from you here soon. But before we jump into conversation, we want to remind all of you, our viewers and our listeners across the globe, who we are. In case we have not met yet. Julia Patrick is here. She's the CEO and the brainchild behind the nonprofit show, uh, working with the American Nonprofit Academy and really excited, uh, you know, that you had this dream, as you said, like four years ago. Now we're moving into our fourth year. And I'm so very honored each and every day, Julia, to serve alongside you. I'm Jarrett Ransom the nonprofit nerd, CEO of The Raven Group, and always love nerding out with Julia and all of our guests. Again, thank you to our presenting sponsors that allow these nerd out sessions every single weekday. Um, and Julia, I had a conversation yesterday with someone and, you know, telling them about the show and they said, wait, you do this every weekday? And so that's the common response, right? Oh, and yeah. I think yeah. I say yes every weekday. And again, you know, a huge nod goes out to our amazing sponsors uh, that allow us that opportunity. So thank you so very much to our besties over at Bloomerang National University with Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and again, of course, our hosting platform, American Nonprofit Academy. Thank you so very much for allowing us these opportunities like the one we're about to have here with Jen. Um, hey, if you missed any of our episodes, uh, there's so many places now you can find them. I want to say like, there's no excuse not to listen to us because we are really everywhere. And the latest is even on your phone. So download the app. You can find us, the nonprofit show still on podcast, still on streaming broadcast. You can find us on all three of these uh, platforms. So that's why I said it could be the wee morning, you know, hours, because you can find us just about anywhere at any given time. So Again, thanks to our sponsors that allow us this opportunity. And then again, Jen, we are so thrilled. Jennifer Banks, manager, your part-time controller, welcome. Thank you so much. I am so excited to have this conversation with the two of you. This is just one of my most favorite topics. It's actually one of the processes I just looked forward to the most, um, you know, when doing day-to-day accounting and controller work. So yeah, just, and I know we're living in very difficult times right now, so just really I'm um, looking forward to having this really important conversation around that. Well, thank you. And we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the birthday or anniversary that your part-time controller recently celebrated. So 30 years of business. So congratulations and thank you for all of the amazing work you do. Uh, this company is across the nation. So Jen, share with us where you're joining us from. Yeah, sure. So I'm located in Irvine. I'm in Orange County, California. So I, I primarily service our clients on the West Coast. So kind of newer, newer geographical region for us. So it's been just a really exciting um, time of growth and just great to work with so many nonprofits out here um, on the West Coast. Wow. Thank you. Amazing. You know, Orange County. Oh, my gosh. There's got <laughs> to be such a wide assortment of nonprofits, um, Orange County being one of the wealth centers of our country. And um, yeah, really cool. I mean, that that's just amazing. And I have to think, Jarrett, Jen's probably the first person we've had from YPTC that's been in Cal from California, right? That I can think of. Yeah. I mean, we've had West Coast, right? Yeah. But I don't think we've had the state of California. Yeah, yeah, really mm -hmm. cool. 
really, really We cool. need a map of YPTC yeah. that we can just flag every single state that a representative has joined us from. Yeah, And really. actually, well, thinking about it, Alicia Eastfold, who talked to you all about data visualization, she she lives in Sacramento, California. So I think she was on the show a few a few yes. months ago. So I might I might be the second person okay. from California. <laughs> yeah, okay. She was another, another lovely uh, conversation that we had. Again, I mean, I just feel like I'm surrounded by nerds and that is a compliment, Jen. Like it's a Thank true you. compliment. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I love people that show up in their profession and they're passionate, you know, and also really willing to share. So that takes us, you know, really to this first talking point. And if you would, Jen, share with us about what it's like right now, budgeting in unusual economic conditions. And I just have to say, Julia, you know, when we started this, this show, th you know, now four years ago, we thought that was unusual. And I feel like the last four years, right, there's there's a yeah. new unusual that continues to, you know, unfold. So Jen, share with us what this might look like for us. Sure. Yeah. And I, I just want to kind of kick things off by saying, I think it's really important to just try as much as possible. I know we're living in this time of uncertainty, but just to really keep a positive frame of mind and also an open mind, because I really feel like budgeting is that chance that we can take during the year to just stop and pause and reflect and just think about what have our achievements been over the past year? Like what have our challenges been? Um, but just let that really um, inform the process moving forward. Um, and yeah, I think it's just a great time to just really kind of have that fresh start mentality. Um, but yeah, just kind of looking, you know, 30,000 feet up in the air. I think it's really important when we're talking about budgeting to just look at that macro perspective. And especially when we're talking about economic conditions, if we think about what we've been facing and we've had financial sector turmoil, banking crisis, um, and actually, the Federal Reserve has just recently predicted that the economy may dip into a recession um, in the back half of this year because of that financial crisis. We've been dealing with high inflation. Uh, we've been dealing with labor shortages. Uh, we have kind of still the fallout of COVID where we had a lot of supply chain shortages. Um, and public debt has soared, you know, kind of what we were talking about earlier. So we do have all of these kind of macro, wider macro conditions occurring um, that, that eventually, I know they're touching many nonprofits now, and if certain, certain things are not, that's going to have a trickle down effect. So I think it's just really important um, to kind of consider those, those options. Um, and one of the things that I really like to do, and I know this is a little bit old school, but I like to kind of go back to my, my SWOT analysis um, and actually uh, do that upside down. I read a great article um, in the Harvard Business Review where they talked about, and sorry, just to kind of backtrack, when we're talking about SWOT, it's just one of these kind of classic um, business business strategy tools where you look at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. Um, and I actually think it's important to do that the other way around, to kind of take that 30,000 foot view, look at these macro conditions, really try and map out our opportunities and our threats within those. And then that really helps to inform the analysis um, of our strengths and weaknesses. It just really puts that into a greater context. So I think just kind of first and foremost, that's a great way to kind of start the planning process. And I know it's a, I, I know it's old school, but I would still recommend doing it. I think it's a really helpful exercise. Yeah. To kind I, of get I love my frame of mind. So I love the SWOT analysis. I use it a lot with strategic planning. I noticed that the majority of people are very familiar already with the SWOT analysis. And I like to add trends. And I'm curious, Julia, if you've seen, you know, SWOT with trends, because definitely looking at what's trending when it comes to efficiencies and technologies and all the tech stacks that we can talk about, right? Um, so I so appreciate that. And whether it's old school, I think it's a classic. <laughs> I think it is a classic too. And, and I think especially, um, and Jen will talk about this a little bit more, but you know, you're not normally sitting at your desk by yourself doing this. You have other people that engage in this process at some point, if not from the beginning. And so to have that kind of um, baseline with SWOT analysis, I think is really helpful. And I also believe that when you do that, you get everybody kind of like on the same page and you're not having to go back and forth, right? 
you're kind of identifying some of these major themes so that that you can drill down and i so okay. i think it's a great tool and i agree with jared everybody pretty much understands what the process is or they can get up to speed quickly you know yeah. when, when the harvard business school came out with this in the late 70s i think it was like 79 or 80 it was such a radical idea you know that it took a long time for people to get going with the concept now you know everybody's like yeah i do it personally when i have you know a, I've, I've had a bad week or i have a good week i mean i i look at what this this matrix can help me through and so yeah i think it's really really smart i really do and and again it's somewhat of a basic thing and and part of this concept of talking about getting ready to do this process because is as you say it is the season and you know we have a little bit of a christmas vibe going on here today <laughs> yeah <laughs> you advise us to make time mental time physical time and space for this process what does that look like yeah so i mean this is the type of process when we're going through it and i think especially you know when times are unusual we may want to do some scenario planning we may want to consider doing budgets that are not just one year out but they're that are actually two years or three years out because we may have um, foundation or grant funding that spans multiple years you know a lot of these economic conditions that we're seeing, they're not necessarily new. You know, they've they've been carrying on for the past, I mean, I think, you know, like you all said, like the past three, three years and even prior to that, we thought we were budgeting in in unusual economic conditions. So this is the type of process where, you know, you're going to want to sleep on it. You're going to want to do do work on it. And then you're going to want to take a break and go do something else and be coming back and looking at it um, with the fresh pair of eyes. And especially if we are you know, bringing team members in, and we know we might have that deadline, you know, of that board, that that board of directors meeting where we need to have that budget approved, or we have um, funding requirements, you know, we, we need to provide a budget for our funders. Um, so making sure everyone is on the same page about those milestones that we need to meet. And I think just building in that time for planning, for drafting, for going back, for making edits, and then for reviewing. Um, and it's just so important that we document our assumptions. Um, and ultimately we're, we're building this out so that we can be proactive and not reactive. Um, and that just really does take time. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not something uh, you can just kind of throw together in a couple of weeks. You know, you wanna, you wanna give yourself um, a couple of months or at least, you know, like four, four, four to six weeks to do this. I mean, that's, that, that, that's generally, you know, what I would, what, what I've done, like with my clients and before I came to YPTC, this was not a quick process of just kind of, you know, throw it, throwing something together in a very short time period. Okay. I, that was like, my next question was, what are we talking about in, in time, uh, in evaluation? Four to six weeks would be your minimum, and that's kind of a crunch, but you're really yeah. looking at this in terms of months. Yeah, yes, yes. I would I would recommend that. Um, and, and again, especially if we're going to do multi-year budgets and do some scenario planning, um, because as we know, when we do face times of uncertainty, we want to be able to pivot. And so kind of thinking through, you know, what's our plan A, what's our plan B, what's our plan C, um, and just kind of laying out those options on the table. And I think I think one of the great things, too, um, if you do kind of budget over a longer period of time, you're not having to start from scratch. You know, like every every single year is not like, oh, gosh, we've got to go back to the drawing board and I've got to remember what we were thinking before and start this process all, you know, all, all over again. So, I mean, and that, and that will also help streamline things a little bit, you know, if you, if you really tried to do a bit of that future, future planning, but, but yeah, I still think you need to kind of have a decent amount of time plan to really think, think through it. What a novel concept. <laughs> like <laughs> I, would, I would love to see that in more of the organizations to have a multi-year budget I feel like one thing that we've seen uh, pretty consistently, Julia and Jen, you know, love your take on this is, you know, in the height of the pandemic, you know, I, I feel like a lot of accounting uh, professionals were saying, you know, do a six month budget and then revisit that or do a quarterly budget and revisit that. And of course, we can always revisit our budget, even a multi-year budget. Um, are you seeing that taking place as well? Uh, like, you know, as, as a pretty popular decision at the moment? 
I, I no, actually, <laughs> no, I mean, in, in, okay. in total transparency, no. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think just in kind of given what we've seen and the more we're talking about these kind of macroeconomic conditions, I, I, I would definitely advocate though, that organizations really do try and do this. Um, because I know one of the trends I have been seeing is with a lot of foundations, they're definitely looking at doing more multi-year contracts. Yeah. And then when you have, you know, multi-year contracts um, or you're, you're, you're renewing your government grants just from a cash flow issue, you know, you might have like private foundation funding that's paid in advance. And then you might have government grant funding that are, you know, they're, they're reimbursable expenses. That's right. And so they're, and they're paid in arrears. And this might span, these agreements might span multiple financial years. So just when you look at where we're trending with where funding is coming from and how that's operating, I mean, it just, it just makes sense to me that you want to, you would want to try and plan your finances out. And I think just going back, you know, to what I said earlier, I think it just makes, it makes it so much easier to then readjust to your, your forecast, your cash flow forecast, you know, to maybe do some quarterly reforecasting. Um, and then when you're kind of doing that annual budget process, you're then updating year two and you're adding year four, you know, but we're, we're much more informed about the near time. So then adding that year four, I mean, that, that might not be as timely of a process to kind of think through. So you're just, you're just building on it over time and you're just really kind of focusing on that big picture and then letting that inform your day-to-day decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate the transparency. Uh, You know, that's exactly what we want here. And Mm -hmm. I know, you know, funders, they're looking for more of a longer budget Mm -hmm. and not these, you know, kind of short stop gaps. Um, I also want to ask you, Jen, like we've seen obviously a high turnover across the nation in so many different positions. I have seen uh, this turnover in the, you know, accounting department, which has impacted the budget, right? Like not only catching up from past, but also being able to prepare, right? For many organizations Mm -hmm. that July 1 fiscal, do you have any tips on, you know, if there has been transition, staff transition, leadership transition within perhaps that accounting financial, you know, area how we can still stay the course when it comes to making time for this? Yes. So I think that, and I know, I know we're going to get to this, but just that kind of buy-in from, from the team. And I think this is really important that budgeting is not just a finance function um, or, or, or an ED function or a board function, you know, it's really across the whole organization. And I know this is something that I've kind of reminded um, I guess teams of nonprofits I worked with before is that if you in your normal course of work, if you are making a decision that involves, you know, spending or receiving money, um, you are part of the finance function. <laughs> you know, so you, you are part of that overall responsibility for stewarding our assets. Um, and I think the more people that you can get involved in the process and that this can be delegated to different areas of the team, um, and then if, you know, if we can get like some good templates in place, and I know this is something that we help a lot of our clients with is just getting that budget structure set up, you know, so you can always kind of pull someone in from the outside um, to help you develop that template and that structure, and then really get all your team members involved um, in this process. And I think that's going to help you kind of weather the storm uh, much better and kind of provide that consistency um, as you as you go so that you have multiple people that may have historical knowledge participating in the process. Yeah, you know, so that does get get into this next question. And that is getting that buy in getting the team. I love that you said that if you're spending money on behalf of your organization or receiving money, you are part of the system. And I don't think I've ever heard anyone articulate it that way. In fact, we had a question that, that came in that said, how do you do a multi-year budget when it's so difficult to prepare for even a one-year budget? How do you get management buy-in? So, you know, we've talked about the process and the structure and what we should be doing and looking at, but at the end of the day, this becomes a people problem, right? Mm-hmm. If, if we can't get this, how do you advise us to navigate this? 
Yeah. So that, I mean, that's a really good um, point with that, with the the question that came in, because this, this is really a tone that's got to be set from the top. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's really the leadership and the board that needs to decide that this is a priority. So um, I know that might, you know, mean maybe the, the, the ED or a board member trying to sell, sell, sell their point and really frame it up to everybody else. Um, but I think, I think by, looking at this multi-year planning and really focusing on the benefits of that. I mean, we're, we're, we're gonna be more prepared. It's gonna really build confidence um, by getting people involved. We're gonna all be taking ownership of our day-to-day -day decisions. And I think it really helps people when they're actively involved in the budgeting process, they really understand how their day-to-day -day decisions are impacting the whole and really just being transparent um, with our finances. And it's a great way to kind of hold people accountable for their decisions. Um, and especially like if we make it a priority, you know, that every month we're going to track our budgets to actuals and let's actually get our team members who are helping us prepare the budget, let's get them involved in the variance analysis so that they can take a look, you know, at, well, why, why did these numbers change? Why didn't things happen the way that they thought they were going to? And kind of putting, you know, like the ball back in our in our wider team's court, um, just so that they can really take ownership um, or give them the the opportunity to take ownership. You know, and I think that's one thing I see a lot is people are just not given the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And when you give people the opportunity, it's actually amazing how decision making changes. You know, the more transparent you are, the more ownership people have. Um, people just tend to make better decisions. And so that would that would be how I how I would just very briefly that would be how I would how I would frame it up <laughs> to I a, to a client that. or a board or anyone about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that we we collectively, the nonprofit sector, right? When we hold on um, from that executive leadership team to the budget and everything that moves around it, I honestly think we're doing a disservice mm -hmm. to our team. And then we're like, you know, we're preventing and eliminating the opportunity, as you said, Jen, for them to be a part of it. Like how empowering, how educating, how informing. And as you said, they're likely to make better decisions because they have more of the, the information. So I'm going to go out on the limb and say, I actually think, you know, when we don't include more people, more team members, we're doing a disservice to our team and to their own professional development. Yeah. I think, even, it's, oh, sorry. Didn't mean well, that. no, I, I echo that because I think there's too many organizations where it's like, they wait until Q4 for the bad news. <laughs> right? right. I mean, and it's like, it makes the finance team look like monsters. And then there's, it's always just a complete beat down. It's such a negative thing versus like, okay, you know, this is where we are. We can do better. What are ideas? I mean, moving the whole team through the process opposed to having it be such a punitive uh, relationship with finance. And so, yeah, I agree. It's got to be, everybody's got to be on the same page. Really important, really important. And I can imagine doing a SWOT analysis, right? With that team, you know, with the, with all of the players, as you said, Jen, if you are receiving or receding, you're part of the process. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I love that. You know, it's really been interesting to hear you talk about this, um, making the process of budgeting more inclusive, um, more positive and more long term. I think that's really brilliant saying, OK, you know, we're moving forward. I've got to ask this one last question of you, and we we don't have that much time, but it seems to me every board I've ever been on that's had this engagement piece with leadership. It's always a growth factor mm. and we don't plan for a reduction necessarily. And we, you know, we're like, okay, well, we've got to increase our donors by this percentage or fund, you know, fund development overall or this or that. What would you say about an organization that's going to recognize that they might be shrinking? Yes. And that is a very good point. Um, that what, yeah, that especially when we're looking at these, these uncertain economic conditions, because if we're 
looking at a potential recession later in the year, you know, donors and corporations, they will hold on to their assets. So we might see that decline. And I've definitely noticed this with my clients, a decline in both corporate and individual giving. Um, and it's, it is really important, I think, to, yes, to definitely let those income estimates to, to, to make them pretty conservative. Um, and it's not that we don't want to grow, but that's where we have our scenario planning where we have plan A, B, and C. So we can, we can predict these different situations that may happen. And just having those plans in place um, is really important. And I think too, just one, one other thing to mention about that when we're looking at income is looking at our sources or, or kind of what our donor restrictions look like. So is it restricted or is it unrestricted? Um, and I think yeah. that's just something that's really important to keep in mind so that as you're looking at projecting that income out, you know, where, what, what, what type of income do we really need? Are we going to be able to cover our operating costs? You know, cause we, where everybody has a fixed cost base, you know, so we need to make sure that at a bare minimum, we're getting that unrestricted funding in um, to be able to, to cover that. Um, yeah. And then just looking for alternative um, sources of funding, because there is a lot, I mean, like billions and trillions of dollars tied up in donor advice funds and private foundations, you know, so just kind of looking, you know, at other at other options, and they're, they're not as affected by these economic turndowns, um, because, because the money has already been given, the assets are already there. So, um, you know, that's just something, you know, to maybe think about as well. Well, spoiler alert, we are going to be spending more time with you all at YPTC on this very topic. Um, because you are right. This is a major input and, and piece of the entire philanthropic pie that we don't really know about. There's a lot of fear, and yet mm -hmm. the, the data is coming in about these staggering amounts yes. of, of money and resources. Um, you know, this is great. I always love you um, the YPTC energy. I always love that uh, you reduce the fear or you eliminate the fear um, and making us understand how at the end of the day, when we do embrace these processes and, and understanding the numbers, that it's it's to the benefit of all of us, right? It's not just, you know, making as, as you know, <laughs> I'm showing my age, but like the bean counters happy as we <laughs> to call them. I mean, you know, it's really an important thing. Um, and so super cool i've got to say we got a, another comment that came in that's a great job everyone very wow. actionable ideas here need to sell c-suite and board to make it happen yeah, i yeah. love that i really I love that too it. that's fantastic yeah. so happy i love that. that and and <laughs> to the person you know that made that comment i also really encourage you to go to the yptc website because there's even more resources I was sharing uh, the YPTC website just yesterday uh, when it came to, you know, um, one of my clients wanted to know what to share, uh, you know, by way of data and how to do it in a visual way. So, of course, I thought of the data. Oh, the team. Yeah. And, and so there's tons of information on the YPTC website. Uh, but Jen, you have been such uh, an amazing guest today. We are so you know, very lucky to have your expertise, your time, <laughs> yeah, your talent here. So again, Jennifer Banks, manager at your part-time controller. Again, congratulations to 30 years oh. YPTC. I love seeing all the birthday <laughs> photos and the celebration. Your background, Jen, of course, is still celebrating <laughs> that 30 years. So thank you uh, thank to you, so Jen, and also to the entire team for all that you do. Thank you. It's been such an honor to, to speak with the two of you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Well, <laughs> we hope you'll come back. Yeah, we hope you'll come to. back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think people think that um, it's 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 stressful going on a live show. I, I own that. And, and believe me, for four years and 800 episodes, it, it's stressful. And I get that. But we try really hard, uh, Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, and myself to make this more fun and more energizing. Um, so that we can all learn something. And I, I know Jarrett would say the same thing. The two of us learn something new every day. Every day. Every day. And it's it's pretty remarkable to say that. Um, and a lot of this knowledge and excitement and, and piece of the pie goes to our partnering sponsors. Because without them, 
we would not be here. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Again, these are the folks that allow us to come to you each and every day with something new and refreshing and something that will help your nonprofits grow and thrive even in, in uncertain times, you know? So um, this is why these folks are with us joining uh, day in and day out. Wow, okay, Jarrett, numbers, baby, gotta love them. I know, I can't wait to push the multi-year budget. Like I'm just all on that right now. <laughs> Yeah, me too, Jen. I think it's, I, I loved so many things of what you said. And I, I, I know that uh, the scenario planning is so important and you have to embrace that, but that really involves a multi-year function as well. So I love this, this, this uh, longer view. I think it's smart and I think it's safe and I think it's the way to go. Um, I also think another way to go is how we end every episode of the nonprofit show. And that's with our mantra to stay well, so you can do well. Thank you, ladies. Have a great day, and we'll see you here tomorrow.